Welcome everyone back to the Western Hemisphere Virtual Symplectic Seminar. Uh, this is the start of the fall 2020 calendar. Um, this fall, um, we have a slightly different plan than over the summer and spring. Uh, we'll be having one research seminar every, every week and one other activity, which could be an informal activity, could be a research seminar, depending on the week. Uh, so please stay tuned for um, our announcements about all of those events. We had our first such informal activity this morning with um, an informal tea. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully have some variety of events going forward. So um, without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Eric Zaslow uh, from Northwestern, who will be telling us about Legendrian weaves. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, good to see so many faces. I mean, uh, faces from all over that you couldn't possibly have had in an in-person seminar. Also, you're right here, an arm's length away, so that's fun. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Legendrian Legendrian weaves, which are uh, a, a way of describing Legendrian surfaces. And this is a joint work with uh, Roger Casals. And Roger is here uh, right now and can um, offer his perspectives uh, on questions. Um, I wanted to maybe start with a little bit of uh, motivation why I study uh, Legendrian surfaces. Um, it's really because um, uh, I'm, I, I, my origin is from physics and uh, three-dimensional Lagrangian brains are uh, a central aspect of string theoretic math, uh, physical and mathematics. Um, and studying the moduli of a brain uh, after Aganagic and Vafa allows you to understand um, things like disk invariance and even, even higher, uh, potentially through uh, Ugori Vafa's work, higher genus um, open chroma witten invariance and uh, Witten's interpretation uh, of the equations governing uh, Grom of Witten theory was that you can build it from all this a wave function of the brain. And, and that's sort of, it's not the holy grail, but it's, you know, for, for me, being able to understand what a brain is, is still a, a, a driving motivation. Uh, and the appeal uh, of being able to use sheath theory to address uh, such questions is, is uh, I find intriguing. So that's why I'm there. But um, there's also lots of um, rich uh, symplectic uh, topology that you can uh, gain from studying Legendre, having a concrete uh, calculus for studying Legendrian surfaces. So that's that that is really what this talk is about about developing that calculus and uh, some applications. And I'll focus on really one application, um, or I'll get to really describing one application, which is uh, proving an infinite number of Lagrangian fillings of uh, of a Legendrian surface. Okay, so let me get to it by uh, sharing screen. <clears throat> Unless you want to start with any questions, that's fine too. Um, I guess the, the protocols uh, questions in chat, um, and I'll try to keep an eye on it, and I'll, I've asked uh, the organizers to help me with that as well. Okay, are we good? Can we uh, share, nod your head or? or anything. Can you see the share screen? Great. Okay, so uh, I talked a little bit about motivation and what we'll do is uh, infinite number of Lagrangian fillings. There's also work, uh, recent work by uh, Casals, Roger Casals and Hong Hao Gao uh, on this and also uh, Hong Hao Gao, Lin Hui Shen and um, Da Peng Wang uh, also proving infinite number of Lagrangian uh, fillings in some contexts. Okay, so every knot there's a braid closure. Um, this is after Alexander, 1923, uh, but not uniquely. There are many different uh, ways to exhibit such a knot. And so there are relations and um, the marker of relations are, are one of those. But that motivates the study of knots by looking in a neighborhood of, uh, of a circle, which the braid closes around. And the, if, you're, if you're studying symplectic topology, the contact counterpoint, uh, counterpart of a circle is the by Weinstein's neighborhood theorem is the first jet bundle of S1. So we might look for a Legendrian knots in the first jet bundle of S1. Uh, all, uh, all exist in, in that way in some sense. And um, just reminding you that, you know, if you're studying contact topology, uh, Weinstein's neighborhood theorem says that locally everything is, is the first jet. Um, so um, local model uh, for a contact manifold is R2 n plus one. Well, let me just make sure that, okay. Um, and 
Yeah, Legendrian, it's the first jet bundle of the Legendrian. And so um, in the case of S1, if, I'm, if we're studying Legendrian knots, which is a good warm up for surfaces, uh, we're looking at the first jet of S1, which is the, its cotangent cross R. So namely uh, differentials of functions and their values. So a uh, easy model for a uh, Legendrian uh, would be to have a function of a uh, angular coordinate data, uh, which we see over here, its differential and its value. And those um, make the coordinates X, Y, and Z. And from that, uh, so you have a one dimensional um, manifold in three dimensional space. There are two natural projections to take, the X, Y coordinates and well, X, Z doesn't seem so natural, but it's good as well. And uh, the first two are called the Lagrangian projection. And this, this uh, generalizes to n dimensions as well, where we just look like that. Um, and then maybe take the ith derivative here. So the Lagrangian projection to the first uh, x and y and the front projection to x and z. And the front projection, uh, the image is a hypersurface and you can recover the missing coordinate by taking dz dx. And you can easily check that uh, the one form vanishes when you do that. Okay, so let's draw a picture of the front projection. Here's a picture of, uh, uh, in purple, the front projection of a knot in uh, the first jet of S1. And so it's some immersed uh, um, Lagrangian Sorry, it's some immersed hypersurface. It's not a Lagrangian. It's a hypersurface. And you, you can see it here. And this one is maybe three to one over the base S1. So I've drawn the S1 down here. And then this is S1 cross R. And in purple, we have the projection. Or maybe in purple and green, um, it, that could also be such a front projection. And we recover the missing coordinate by the slope of the line, as I would say. So we can encode this. Um, a little bit more efficiently down on S1 by just remembering how many strands there were um, over a point. And as long as there are no cusps, we don't even have to indicate uh, where there might be cusps. We just indicate where the strands cross. And up to isotopy, that's a, that's a faithful description of the Legendrian knot. Okay. So then we just get labeled set of points down, a, down along S1, labeled by the different crossings of the front projection. And um, if we were um, not in S1 uh, cross R, but if the whole thing were happening in, so if, if we have this disk up here, which I've drawn in, in green, if that actually closes and isn't a cylinder, but closed up, closes up to a disk, uh, there's some feedback. Okay, if that closes up to a disk, uh, then you see, can see that this uh, Markov move, um, you can sort of take this green strand and unloop it. And those, uh, those that three strand um, front projection and the four strand front projection with the extra crossing really describe the same knot. That's probably more familiar to everyone in the audience than even to me. So um, that's the Markov move. And um, so just the lesson is that we can encode these things as long as there are no cusps um, uh, efficiently, like uh, by indicating the crossing locus down in the base. Okay, so that's what we've said. So now if we have a Lusandrian surface, we do the same exact thing. Its front projection is um, lies in um, the surface cross R. Let's, let's, let's take the surface to be S2, the two sphere. So the plane compactified at infinity. So then we can just draw the, the front projection in three dimensional space. And um, uh, what will it look like? It'll look like a bunch of sheets immersed in three dimensional space. And that's what I've drawn, what, what I'm trying to draw, draw here. So let's, try to do the same uh, more efficient encoding of those sheets. So we're going to look down on the base, which is now the plane. And we just indicate down along the base when those sheets cross. So you see in blue here, um, we have uh, an indication that the, the first two sheets 
moving up are crossing, and in red indication the, the, the sheets two and three are crossing. Okay. So we get a planar diagram. Uh, more things can happen. Uh, we can have three planes uh, meeting, uh, just like in the corner of the room, or in calculus, we draw the coordinate uh, planes like this. And actually, that is uh, uh, how we would want to indicate it, because in that in this picture, of when we draw in calculus, you know, x, y, z. I'm not actually co calling these coordinates x, y, z. Um, but we do like this, and we draw a dotted line, meaning that the, the, the coordinate planes are crossing, but behind uh, the first plane. So, you know, sheets two and three are crossing. So the way we would indicate that um, is down here in this planar projection. In blue, the first two sheets crossing, and in, in red, the, the next two sheets crossing. Hope that's clear. What else can happen? Well, the only other thing that we're going to be considering, since we're ignoring cusps, are um, this um, uh, behavior of a front projection, which is not generic. Um, generically, you would have cusps. Um, and and generically, if you perturb this, uh, if you move this um, Legendrian surface a little bit, uh, you'll get something with a bunch of cusps. But non-generically, you have something which is uh, as simple as this. And this is sort of a two-sheeted potato chip over the space. And um, what happens is that those sheets themselves cross here and here and here. And then the crossings merge into a Y vertex there. I can't, um, yeah, I think that's, that's as, as well as I can draw it. You can actually, um, um, you know, draw this on your computer. You just take, actually, this just take a complex cusp. So T is a complex coordinate, and take this coordinate and um, this coordinate, or the real part of this uh, third coordinate, which is one, two, three coordinates, and then you can just draw that on your own. It's fun to do, and you get that kind of potato chip. So that's the other behavior that can happen. So the two sheets can uh, interact in this Y-shaped vertex. Okay, so these are the ingredients for, that we'll use to describe Legendrian surfaces. And notice that uh, because of this, um, this sort of self-tangency of these two sheets, uh, this point is actually one point in the Legendrian surface, whereas um, there are two points in the Legendrian surface over this crossing. Because they have different slopes, they represent different points. But because this potato chip merges with itself at the same slope, uh, that's just a single point. So this Legendrian surface is branched over the base surface with two to one with a branch lo locus being the vertex there. I hope, I hope that the pictures uh, help illustrate that a little bit. Okay, so now we use that to define uh, um, the, the diagrammatic structure um, that will encode the surface. We'll call that an N graph. It's a collection of embedded cubic graphs, cubic uh, meaning trivalent, because those are the only types of uh, interactions that, that we're having uh, on a surface S. Uh, and the graphs are labeled, and, and that corresponds to the labeling of the sheets that cross. And the one graph interacts GI in, intersects GI plus one. That's just like what was happening in the corner of the room or the coordinate planes in calculus. So you can have this sort of um, hexagonal vertex with the interlacing um, uh, colors. With one color, I draw it as dotted line, this one here. So GI intersects GI plus one, only at vertices whereupon the edges interlace. Exactly uh, just what I said before, we're building up uh, a, a graphical diagram out of the pieces that we just described above. And we'll call the Legendrian weave, the Legendrian surface up to isotopy, described by this graph up to planar isotopy. So what we're calling a two graph then is a collection of one <laughs> embedded cubic graph. Uh, uh, and, and then this, this uh, further condition is null for a two graph. So a two graph is just an, um, a two graph would just be a cubic graph. And that still des describes uh, interesting Legendrian surfaces. Um, okay. 
So let's call the Legendrian surface lambda inside the first jet of the base surface S, which I'm calling. And from that, we can define a category. I won't spend a whole lot of time on the category, uh, but we can define from this, uh, uh, su from a surface, a category of uh, sheaves, constructible sheaves, uh, with singular support along the uh, Legendrian surface. And we put a further condition on this constructible sheaths that they be what's known as uh, simple. Uh, so um, that's maybe a technical con condition, which I'll just uh, elaborate upon uh, as it applies in practice rather than go into the theory there. So uh, the, uh, from the work of Guillermo, Kashiwara, and Shapiro, um, Shapira, sorry, um, this category is an invariant. So as you isotope the Legendrian surface, um, you get an uh, equivalent category. And actually from this category, you can define a moduli stack of objects and which is uh, in our uh, applications, almost always a moduli space. So you have just an ordinary uh, space of objects, oops, <laughs> objects in this category. I'll, I'll describe that in some, some more detail, how to construct this space. In fact, in one you can do this is you can do this in any number of dimensions. All this same formalism. Uh, so let's, as an example, and warm up, see what happens in one dimension. So, I would define this category of uh, this is some category of sheaves on. Uh, in this case, the S, the base space is 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 a real line. So S cross R, which is just this picture, and um, on the uh, whiteboard. And the sheaves, uh, we're going to sort of require them to be zero down below the, the front projection. And then this little one indicator is that um, the stalk of the sheaf is going to jump by one. The, the rank of the stalk of the sheaf is going to jump by one each time you cross a line. So it, I'll just put down the, the ranks of the stalks or the dimensions of the stalks if our coefficient ring is a field so that we have vector spaces of dimension 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So I'm looking at uh, constructible sheaves, sheaves that are locally constant on uh, this um, whiteboard, um, except possibly where the, the stalks can jump across where the front projection is. And they jump in this manner. And the data of a sheaf um, means that you, have, you actually get maps like this. So in total, you get a flag, a complete flag. So in, the, in this case, uh, where your front projection is a bunch of horizontal lines, uh, this moduli space of objects in this category of sheaves is just the flag variety. Is that good? I can't see if there's anything going on in chat. Um, I guess not. I don't know if that's a good or bad sign, but I continue. Okay, so um, we have, uh, we now have a description of the Legendrian surfaces and of the moduli space of objects. Um, and that being an invariant, you can use that moduli space to, you know, uh, distinguish non isotopic surfaces. If they're different, then they're different. Okay, so let's, let's look at um, what else can happen when you have isotopic uh, surfaces? So um, you have, in the case of Legendrian uh, knots in 1D, you have um, front projections, which are these, these strands, and there can be crossing, and then you have Reitermeister moves. And here's a picture of the Reitermeister move. And uh, the way that looks down in our encoding of these crossings is here we have the, you know, these strands and that, those two strands and these two strands, and then it swaps those blue, blue and red colors. So that's a picture of what the Reitermeister move looks like, that this configuration is equivalent to that configuration. And if you take a movie of that Reitermeister move, um, what would happen? You would bring this strand down through the crossing. I don't know if, I don't know if that's the best color to be annotating with, maybe. This one hasn't been used. If I bring this strand down through the crossing, um, then these blues um, in this movie get closer and closer and closer, and then they cross through. 
So this actual, actually this hexagonal sort of uh, ingredient that we use to construct the Legendrian surfaces is formed as a movie uh, of this Reitermeister move. And that's not so um, uncommon that um, the movies of the, of the moves give interesting structures in higher dimension. And if you wanted to look at the nitty gritty of the moduli spaces, you'd fill these uh, spaces in with flags, zero at the bottom, as I, as I was saying, and then add one uh, dimension to the rank of the stock as you move up across the, the picture. And you do the same thing on the right, giving you two different flags. And then there's a condition, which I'll uh, maybe come to a little bit later, that this, um, the rank of the, uh, of the stock of the constructible sheaf in this region in between uh, would be two. And actually V1 and V1 prime are both uh, by these maps, subspaces, and they're transverse. So this middle one is just their sum. And then down here uh, across the, um, so in, in particular, the middle region is determined from the outer regions and the same is true over here. Uh, whatever this thing is, it's some rank one, uh, so it's some line, and then it sits inside this two-dimensional space and in that two-dimensional space. And so it's just their intersection in the overall three-dimensional space here. Anyway, that was just a way of describing that the moduli space of such configurations on the left is the same as the moduli space of such configurations on the right. And that's a demonstration of this uh, GKS equivalence uh, in this example. So that's how isotopias play out in 1D. Um, in 2D, um, what happens? So here we are uh, over here now in the picture of two dimensions. We have this Legendrian surface. We might be interested in uh, what is the moduli space of objects that you get in this category? And it's really the same story as we saw, I'm going to move this up, as we saw back here. Each time you cross, you add a dimension and you generate a flag as you go up through um, the front projection. So here, here would be a point in the base. And as we come up through the front projection, we cross it once. So we start with zero and then one, and then two, and then we cross it another time. So we get a flag over each point in that base. And because the corresponding sheaf is required to be locally constant, uh, at every region there in the base, if it's simply connected, uh, we just get, we can think of it as just a single flag assigned to each region. Okay, I'll come back to that in, in a little bit. Okay, so um, what do isotopies uh, look like? Well, this, uh, the Reitermeister uh, move was encoded in this way. So these two pictures, uh, I'm now down here, in uh, one dimensions really represent uh, equivalent uh, Legendrian knots. Likewise, there will be uh, different uh, pictures, different end graphs uh, drawn in the two-dimensional plane, which will represent isotopic Legendrian surfaces. So let's see, uh, what would that do? If you took a movie of the Reitermeister three move and then the Reitermeister three move inverse, uh, that would look like this picture here. Um, but that would be the same as doing nothing at all, which would be look like this picture here. So in fact, these two uh, are isotopic Legendrian surfaces. This one, with a, this one on the left with a front projection that has these sort of complicated uh, intersections of three, three planes. And on the right, where you just have um, just the three planes intersecting, just like up here, and then cross R. Is that good? Okay, that's, that's the easy one. Uh, now, uh, if, as things get a little bit more tricky, how, what happens when you have an isotopy which interacts some way with the front projection that has one of these uh, trivalent vertices? So I've tried to draw a picture of that. It's, it's a little bit hard to see maybe. Here I have this potato chip. Um, Maybe, I don't know if uh, you should be able to see me maybe on a small screen for you, but uh, you have this flat potato chip and then you have this angled plane coming in, interacting with that potato chip. And the potato chip is two layers. So 
it'll create several intersections. Um, and that's what we see over here, these two intersections of the potato chip with the plane. And then they themselves cross where the potato chip crosses itself. Um, and then you have this picture here on the left. Now, without changing anything, I can move that plane through because, because the plane has different slopes than the potato chip. These are not intersecting upstairs in contact five space. Remember, different slopes means the different missing coordinator, uh, coordinate. So um, I move that through. It's perfectly good isotopy. But the picture changes, and it turns into this picture on the right. And maybe you can see that if you take this green plane and push it through, it will intersect a lot more, because that's where the potato chip has this sort of bubble of self-intersections. OK, so we have these, other, these intersections there. And if I'm really good, well, I'm not really good, so I'm, maybe I'm <laughs> Uh, I would be able to draw what these self-intersections look like, and then they come down and up, and then like that. Um, yeah, so that would be it. But then they would also be on the green thing. All right, so I, I'm not so good, but then you get all this stuff here. Okay, uh, and you can do more. Um, maybe you have four planes at different angles, forming a, a, like a tetrahedron, but extended. Um, and then you take the fourth plane, the hypotenuse of the tetrahedron, you push it through, not changing anything because all the slopes are different, but the picture of the intersection locus will look very different. And hopefully you can see in this picture on the left, um, it actually looks a little bit like a tetrahedron, extended, and that's just a picture of the, self, uh, of the intersections of the surfaces. And now what, what we've done is we've taken this uh, blue plane and pushed it through now it's behind, so we have to give it a different color. And it, now it becomes this green picture there. But th those are isotopic. And uh, so those two pictures represent isotopic uh, pieces of a Legendrian surface. And they have a nice interpretation if you like. Um, it's, it's like um, if you look at this arc here and you record the intersections of the arc, it's uh, red, blue, red, blue, red, green, red, blue, red, or in, in numbering those intersections, you know, the intersection of the second and third plane, first and second, second and third. So we number it two, one, two, three, two, one. And then as you push this arc through, the, these intersections change. And you record them, you get this sequence of uh, Reitermeister moves giving you some isotopy on, on the left. And over here, you get this sequence over here. And the equivalence of these two uh, is known as Zemlogikov's relation. Or maybe a Reitermeister 4 move, if you like. OK, that's got getting uh, maybe too uh, deep into the woods. Uh, and this other one is as well. But um, this is, uh, you can generalize the, the Markov move. So if you're, if you're compact, um, if you're taking cl uh, a closure, um, uh, if you're closing up uh, the surface at infinity, uh, then uh, this uh, picture and this picture surrounded by this uh, red ladybug, whatever G is, uh, will represent isotopic uh, Legendrian surfaces. Um, sorry, no, uh, you have to add in all this other stuff. Um, they'll represent isotopic uh, Legendrian surfaces just like the Markov move adds in another strand and another crossing um, and then represents a, an isotopic knot. Okay, so those are the ingredients. We have ways of building surfaces and ways of de, uh, seeing when they're isotopic uh, to one another. Here's some examples of, of, of two graphs. So those are cubic planar graphs um, over here in uh, Black uh, is one, and you can see there's one, two, three, four vertices. And so because it's a two graph, we're representing a two-sheeted cover over the plane. And as I explained, uh, these are branch points. So a two-sheeted cover over the plane with four branch points is a genus one surface. So there's a Legendrian uh, torus. And this one is um, actually the Clifford torus. And we can look at the moduli space pretty easily in this case. Remember, um, we have a uh, flag, 
at each region, because you're going to cross the surface twice. It's a two-step flag, which is just a point in uh, the projective line. And um, there was this condition that neighboring um, lines, that the lines of neighboring uh, flat, uh, regions uh, were transverse. That means that the points are themselves distinct. So around this vertex here, we have three uh, two-step flags, or three points in P1, all distinct from one another. So we, we can use uh, PGL2 to make them 0, 1, infinity. And now this moduli space is a space and not a stack. There's no more uh, freedom. Um, and then the fourth point uh, has to be distinct from each of these because this region neighbors all the other regions. Uh, so we have uh, P1 minus three points uh, as a choice of, for the fourth point, which is a pair of pants. So that's the moduli space in this example. And this was the, this was the, essentially the, the, the case that was studied by Aganagach and Vafa uh, originally in, in, in finding the moduli space of this um, brain. The brain being a, the Lagrangian threefold bounding this uh, two-dimensional clipper torus. Okay, and they were able to uh, get a disk invariance from that. So that's one of the applications of this kind of uh, construction. And, and, but in this case, the moduli space is rigorously defined and you don't have to go through mirror symmetry or, um, um, or uh, physical argumentation to find it. Okay, here's another example, a genus two surface, uh, because there are six uh, vertices over here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, ignore the blue, that's just, um, what is the blue? Uh, the blue is recording the possible choices. So um, each um, node of the blue is, uh, represents a region of the black uh, picture. And so we choose a point in P1 for each node of the blue, which is there, therefore just a graph coloring of this dual blue graph. And so the moduli space is the space of uh, graph colorings of the dual graph. Uh, except the colors are taken to be points in, in P1. So if we look at P1 over a finite field, uh, FQ, then there's Q plus one colors. And the moduli space is the space of, uh, if I want to count how many colorations there are, there are namely how, count how many points in this moduli space over a finite field, that's exactly it. It's the chromatic polynomial of that dual graph. Um, quotiented by the PGL2. So that denominator is just the number of points in PGL2. Okay, so that was uh, what uh, we can do. Use this uh, sheaf theoretical description of the Fukaya category to construct moduli spaces, which are invariants of these Legendrian surfaces. Let me say that um, let me give you the definition here. Uh, so the moduli, uh, I feel like I've gone backwards. Oh no, I just drawn the picture in one dimension. Uh, oh yeah, so one dimension, uh, just re re recounting what I've said before. Yeah, that was the picture from before. The moduli space is a flag for each region uh, with, with this condition at the crossings, namely that the different um, spaces in the flag uh, are uh, transverse to one another. So what happens when, if you look at in one dimension, uh, if you look over here on the left, you just get the flag variety. And then after you cross, what is the new information that you have? Well, you have the choice of what flag you put, uh, what um, piece of the flag you put here, because this piece has to be the same as that, that piece is the same as that, that piece is the same as that. So those two flags are almost the same thing. And the only additional choice for the next flag after the crossing is this other um, vector space. And really, it's just a, if you see how it comes, uh, because V1 is common to both, you can quotient by V1 here. Um, and so think of that as zero. And just look sort of in this neighborhood, maybe I'll redraw that here. V1 is common, so you have something like this. So the, really the additional choice of one prime is some line in, uh, in P1. 
and that line has to be transverse from this line one. So it's, it's, it's not all of the P1, it's P1 minus a point. So instead of growing a P1, each time you move across a crossing, you grow an affine line, P1 minus a point. If you had grown the whole P1, then the total space here would be a P1 bundle over a P1 bundle over a P1 bundle over the flat variety. Labeling different flags that are transverse to one another in this regard. So that such a thing is a Bot Samuelson variety. And this is an open version of that because we have this condition that you don't add the whole P1, but just uh, most of it. So this is called an open Bot Samuelson variety. And that's the modular space. Okay, and in higher dimensions is the same exact thing. We'll, we'll be interested in two dimensions. So we have this moduli space, which is a flag in each region, transverse according to the labels, um, modulo overall uh, PGLN. Like I said, uh, usually that uh, quotient uh, leaves you with a, a smooth variety. But in, if, you, if you don't have sort of enough vertices, then, then it might not. And then that's it. It, you know, if your regions happen to be non, uh, simply, uh, if, you're, if your base space is not simply connected, you might have some monodromy possibilities, but um, it will be in our case. So that's it, that's really it. Easy to describe the moduli space. Because the moduli space has a local description, you can sort of glue it uh, along the boundary pieces. So here's a, here's a, a graph. Uh, and if I sort of just uh, indicate a, a way of separating it into two regions with this uh, purple line, you can think of this moduli space, this here, and this moduli space there. There's also moduli space uh, for the Legendrian uh, not described by this one-dimensional picture. And there are restriction maps to that. And then if you take the fiber product over those restriction maps, then you get the whole thing, which is just really the statement that uh, you can glue this, uh, that this moduli space is locally defined. After all, it's a moduli space of sheaves. Sheaves are local, and that's, that's really why. OK. Um, let me just check. Uh, oh, yeah, and because there are these restriction maps to boundaries, like if you have this piece, then there would be a map to this boundary data, which is some bot Samuelson, open bot Samuelson variety, to this boundary data, which is another open bot Samuelson variety. And then the sort of the cohomology of the moduli space would become a bimodule for the cohomology of the bot samuelson varieties on, on the bound. And so um, there's some relation to the people who study exactly this for understanding uh, knot invariance. And uh, th there's a Sergal calculus of such bimodules developed by Ben Elias and Jordy Williamson. And they have a lot of the same pictures, just dis discovered independently. Um, and I think uh, Roger and uh, Ben are, are discussing the relations uh, with one another. Okay, um, let's see. All right, I wanted to say a few remarks in honor of Vaughn Jones. As I said to some of the people, I'm giving this talk from uh, New Zealand and Vaughn uh, Jones just died uh, last week. Um, it was a, a long-standing goal of mine to be able to uh, develop a theory that was rich enough to to maybe capture his interest in in, in planar in the planar structures. Um, unfortunately, that that won't. Um, I mean, unfortunate for many other reasons, but that won't come to pass. Uh, but I did want to say something about it. So we have these pictures of uh, uh, two graphs, and then we can we can uh, join them up, and we can you know create uh, sort of an algebra, algebra by uh, joining up pictures. Each picture is, uh, is describing a Legendrian surface. Um, but because of isotopy, the pictures have relations among them. And, uh, and relations among the moduli space. And So in this case, the, the, you know, the invariants were the uh, chromatic polynomial of the graph. And there's a chromatic algebra uh, developed by Paul Fenley and Václav uh, Kruskal and Ian Egel about uh, 
the algebra of, of planar graphs like this, cubic graphs. And the way the algebra is developed is to really to encode the, um, the relations uh, among the chromatic polynomials, which is the contraction deletion uh, relation. And so what they did is that they um, were able to embed this chromatic algebra. It's the one that says that if you have you know, this equals this plus uh -oh, um, this. And it, you can do this purely uh, cubically by making that, that plus, whoops, that. Now this is a purely cubic relation. And you imposing that relation uh, is what is, it's the defining relation of this chromatic algebra. So this algebra embeds to the temporally Lieb algebra in the following manner, replace each strand by this picture here, replace each vertex by this picture here, um, where this is just shorthand for a whole, whole bunch of pictures. Um, uh, but unfortunately, I don't know of a way of doing that for, uh, for the relations that we get for the, for three graphs and higher. Um, so that's what, that's what I said here. Possibly, uh, we thought maybe re relation to the SLN webs, the, the webs of um, Greg Cooperberg and others, but um, don't don't really see a, a way that it's uh, already studied. Maybe it's just something something new, some algebra associated to these uh, flag varieties. Okay, so uh, this is a bit uh, sort of scattered talk, and because there are relations in different directions, you know, for planar structures and these. Um, uh, circle calculus, and I don't know which of those directions the audience uh, likes most. Uh, um, so I'm just sort of touching upon them, and then I'll uh, focus in on, on, on one result. Uh, one relation which will be uh, crucial is the relation to cluster theory, and I'll say a little bit uh, more about that. Okay. Um, so to do that, we, we might want to look a little bit more about the topology of these surfaces. So what happens in the neighborhood of uh, an edge? <clears throat> Let's just say a two graph. We have that and we have an edge. And we remember that each vertex was a branch point for a two-fold cover. And so what happens when you have a line between two branch points? You get a loop upstairs. So each edge here represents a one cycle upstairs. And you can just sort of see that here, you, uh, it's, this is in green, this one cycle up here. Um, you could, if you followed along green, you'd, you'd let's say be on the top and then on the bottom and then on the top. And there's actually, um, what's my point? Oh yeah, so my point is that you can't contract that green circle down because of the branch point here. Okay, so each edge represents a one cycle an edge of each sort of monochromatic edge represents a one cycle. And then if you look, you have two edges intersecting at a point here. Um, the one cycles will intersect at one point. It looks like two, but really these are on opposite sheets here. Uh, you see that, uh, yeah. So if, if we're at green top, if for the green one, the top sheet, then the bottom, the top sheet. So the green is on top and top at these two points of intersection. But the red goes from top to bottom because it has crossed over here. Okay, so you can, so the red intersect green is plus one. And then this, if the red were down here, the intersection would be minus one. It's easy to see that. So you can model then, uh, you know, you can write down the uh, homology lattice easily together with its intersection pairing. And that'll be useful for the application to clusters. Here's another one cycle. If you have, um, uh, here I have a, ignoring the green, I have one of these hexagonal vertices and this sort of Y-shaped thing. And that does represent a one cycle. Um, if you just follow the, what's going on along uh, the pre-images of these green points, um, because there are two colors here, we have a three, three-fold uh, branch cover. And, um, those three points, well, maybe, maybe just, um, I don't know. 
hard to go through all of it. But if I look at the preimage of this Y, then these two points will merge at the branch point, at the bottom of the Y, but the, they're all different up here um, at this central hexagonal vertex because all the slopes are different, just like the corner of the room, the slopes of the different walls are different. So these three points are distinct and then they, but then they join, two of them join at each of the edges and in such a way that uh, you get this loop here. And that can be extended. So anytime you sort of see a tree inside your picture, you get a one cycle. Okay, other things that, um, other aspects of topology that you can read off from pictures. If you look at this picture versus this, then um, what you actually get is the connect sum of these two surfaces along this, uh, along these vertex. And the picture is, is itself literally the connect sum if you erase a little uh, piece of it and then join these, um, you get that picture there. So that's one way of seeing the connect sum. There's a kind of global connect sum that you can see if you, if you take a connect sum with a, uh, with a Clifford uh, torus, which is what we saw from the tetrahedron graph. If I connect sum that with that picture there, I get that picture there. So that's a connect sum with a, with a torus. And we actually looked at the moduli space of that torus and we saw that it was a pair of pants. And, so, and when you take connect sum, you just take product of the moduli spaces. So if you just start blowing up your graph in this way, then you, you, you introduce more and more pair, pairs of pants. Okay, so these are some actually useful, um, you can actually utilize these ob observations uh, as you study the moduli spaces. Oh, and, and, and here's a mutation. That's this HI relation. You can see this, this circle and, the, and a fill, if you had a filling disk, uh, the circle and the associated disk shrink down to a point and then grow back up in a, in a new uh, circle and a new disk those two disks intersecting at a point, and that's what you would call um, surgery then. Sorry, uh, yeah, that surgery is a mutation, also sometimes called a flop. Okay, so um, I'm going to now focus on the application, which is to use uh, some of these ingredients uh, to find Lagrangian fillings, exact Lagrangian fillings, of Legendrian knots. And we'll need some cluster, uh, the relationship uh, to cluster theory to do so. So just speaking very generally, if you have a Legendrian uh, uh, curve, here a Legendrian one-dimensional curve, and here's this, in L, here's this picture of a Lagrangian um, surface bounding the curve, maybe with some topology here. Let's think Fukai theoretically, we would, we expect that creates an object and because it can be endowed with local systems, uh, if, I, if I consider the rank one case, I get a whole torus worth of objects in the Fukai category defined by uh, exact Lagrangians um, bounding in some sense this uh, Lagrangian knot. And if we're lucky, that torus of objects that you get from a Lagrangian filling is a cluster chart. So this relation to cluster theory um, has been explored in prior works. Um, and if you just sort of look in, in details at uh, a, cl uh, a cluster um, transformation, a mutation, then uh, you can uh, go and look at what happens to the coordinates and they transform like cluster coordinates. So the coordinates being the, the holonomies around the different uh, loops here. And because those coordinate transfer, tr transformations are not in, invertible, um, this is birational, you get non-isotopic uh, Lagrangians uh, for lo the Lagrangians representing different uh, cluster charts. Let's see what, how um, we can use diagrams to find these 
exact Lagrangian fillings of Legendrian knots. So I've done that here. So <clears throat> this picture should be, uh, will be easy to understand if you just uh, ignore that blue. That blue is the dual graph of the black uh, <clears throat> two graph. So try to ignore the blue. Then we get this black graph. It's a two graph, so it's a cubic planar graph. And on, drawn in the disk, and the boundary of the disk, we have a circle that's on the edge. And remembering what that black graph is representing, it's representing a two-sheeted cover with the sheets crossing at the, at the black. So over this circle, this is the base circle here, we have this red two-sheeted cover crossing at the black. So it's one, two, three, four, five crossings. So that red is the, our Legendrian knot. That's what I've drawn up. Oops, I've drawn it here. Um, generally, that was that picture was represent to, was meant to represent a Legendrian knot, and here it is in in practice. This red circle here. Okay, now let's consider not just the boundary points of this black picture, but the whole entire black picture. That represents a Legendrian surface. And if we go back and look at the Lagrangian projection of that Legendrian surface, we get an exact Lagrangian manifold. And the boundary of that Lagrangian manifold is this Legendrian uh, red curve. Further, that Lagrangian is, has no rabe cords. It's embedded. What would a rabe cord be? I'll draw this picture here. What would a, oops, sorry. What would a rabe cord look like? Well, for these cubic planar graphs, over this region here, you have two sheets. And but at the boundary of the region, those sheets come together. So you have a pillow over that region. And at some point in that pillow, the slope of the top piece of the pillow and the bottom piece of the pillow will be the same. And you'll have a rape cord there. And you can actually organize it so that it, there's a single rape cord uh, in each, uh, in each uh, region there. But there are no regions in this picture here. This one here. So there are no rape cords. You can easily arrange it to be no rape cords. And that means that there's no self-intersections of this exact Lagrangian surface. And you get an honest exact Lagrangian filling of that Legendrian knot. Just by drawing that picture, that picture, that black picture is dual to this blue picture, which is an ideal triangulation of a five gun and their Catalan number of such things. And so if you're looking at exact Lagrangian fillings of two N, knots, uh, then you have this Catalan number of distinct um, um, exact Lagrangian fillings. So we're going to do a uh, variation of that, um, but we're going to exploit this uh, relation to cluster theory to do so. So these, um, all right, so may maybe to, to, to point out uh, that um, what does, what does the cluster mutation look like in terms of these uh, ideal triangulations? Well, sorry. there's the graph, there's the dual triangulation. And now you mutate that graph and you get um, this graph. What happens to the triangulation? It, it, it flops. So you do that, um, and then you, but, and then so that gives you a different uh, exact Lagrangian filling after the mutation. And so if you can mutate for these more complicated pictures, you might have a chance of getting lots of different uh, exact Lagrangian fillings of, of your Legendrian knots. If you only looked at these two twofold covers, uh, you only get these finite number of fillings. But uh, when you start looking at three N knots, you can get more fillings. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to, I'm going to skip a little bit about N triangulations and just see how we can get infinitely many non-isotopic uh, exact Lagrangian fillings of some Legendrian knots. 
And uh, this asterisk says that we couldn't have done it with the two graphs because we just looked at the two graphs and we always got this uh, finite Catalan number. Okay, so the idea was to realize, as I was saying, realize the mutations on Lagrangian filling charts and exploit the cluster theory to, to show that there are different charts and, and so distinct um, surfaces. So um, what did we need? We wanted some sort of uh, quiver that we could arrange uh, through, um, by, uh, th through these uh, three graphs or higher graphs, um, where these arrows of the quiver were the intersections of the, of the one cycles of, on these Lagrangians. And the nodes uh, represent the different one cycles. That's because the cluster coordinates are the uh, monodromies around the one cycles of these fillings. Sorry if I didn't say that. Yes. Oh, I think I, I added it up here. Right? Uh, uh, no, sorry. I just didn't say it. Okay, so that's what we want is a, uh, a quiver that can be mutated in infinitely many different ways. In, in, in such a way that we can realize those mutations uh, through these diagrams. Uh, so uh, Dylan Thurston kindly provided us with this quiver here. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six nodes, uh, and the arrows are in this in this way. Maybe put in the other nodes. Okay, and I'm going to define a sequence of mutations uh, delta to be mu one, mu two, mu three, mu four, mu five, where mu um, where the mu i represents mutation at the ith vertex. So you can do that and, and then uh, mutate that quiver and get um, n times and you get this quiver, which is distinct. And so you're gonna get a distinct cluster chart. So now the goal is can we realize those mutations uh, graphically uh, on a bunch of graphs that uh, fill some uh, Legendre uh, not. So let's do that. Here's this di initial diagram. And we can realize that this way uh, through this picture. So in this picture, you look at the <coughs> red and the blue, in ignoring some of the decorations. And then <coughs> you can find in that picture a bunch of one cycles representing the, the nodes of the quiver. Here's one here. Call that two, there's three, six, four, five. So those are edges, those are monochromatic edges of the graph, so they represent one cycle. And then there's one more, there's this tree. This way. Oh, maybe I forgot something down there. Uh, that tree, and that will be uh, the, the one cycle for the one quiver, quiver labeled one here. If you look at the intersection pattern, okay, the intersection of two with one is the same as three with one and four with one and five with one. That's this here. But six with one is different. You see, it, it's, it comes from the other side. So the arrow here goes in the different direction. And now you mutate according to this rule uh, here. Do that mutation n, n times. Let's just do it once. Um, so I didn't describe how to mutate uh, along these more complicated cycles, and that was part of the trick, uh, but we were able to do that. Um, and what do you get? So the, this is, represents some exact Lagrangian filling, and you can check that it has no rabe cords, so uh, uh, non-immersed, exact Lagrangian embedded filling of this boundary knot. What, what knot do we have on the boundary? Well, you just record these intersections. This is kind of complicated knot. But there you go. We have a filling of it. We mutate, we get a new filling. And so here's a picture of the, just doing the one mutation. And it gets kind of messy. But along the boundary, you have the same knot. Blue, 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 red. That's the red there. Blue, 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 red. Blue, 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 red. And so on. And indeed, this, this is an allowable picture. And you keep going, you get a whole bunch more. And uh, in this way, you can get infinite number of uh, exact uh, Lagrangian fillings of that knot. 
and you can play a similar game to build concordances. Uh, here is a concordance between uh, these blue and uh, the not defined by this blue and red picture. And if you think of this as a tube, you can just sort of concatenate the tube onto itself infinite number of times, and you'll get an infinite number of uh, concordances uh, for that picture. Eric, are you writing? Oh, am I not writing like the whole entire time? No, or it's just it... the last couple of minutes. Oh, I think the, 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 the screen share uh, froze. Um, thank you. I can see luckily, that, moving. luckily, that's the very end, so I will um, reshare, and then that'll be it. So I'll, I'll just leave it up. Can you see it now? Yes, that's that's good. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. So uh, just to, just to repeat, we uh, mutated that uh, original picture and got a much more complicated picture. Uh, this crazy thing here, but it fills the same knot. And it's, it, uh, you can check it, it's, uh, there's no rave chords, it's an exact Lagrangian fill-in. And you can play a similar game um, just by having an annulus. Now you have two different Legendrians, or maybe the same, uh, and you have a, a, a concordance if you have the same one. And if I think of that annulus as a tube, I can now um, compose that concordance with itself and get an infinite number. And you, check that there are distinct uh, uh, concordances between this 3-6 knot. Okay, so um, those are some techniques that you can use to explore Legendrian surfaces and some applications you can do with them. And I highlighted a few directions. Um, right, uh, so that's it. Thanks for coming. Great, thanks so much. Let's thank Eric for the great talk. You can unmute yourself and clap if you want to. <laughs> uh, so it looks like you have a question uh, from Bahar. Bahar, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? In your first oh, example, you do not mutate it. <laughs> That's right. Um, so that was, uh, if I mutate it at six, I don't know that we'd be able to analyze what happens with that, uh, with that quiver so well. So um, that was the trick that uh, Dylan Thurston found. Is it, he, he found this quiver and said, well, if you don't mutate at six and you just define this, you can sort of do it again and again and again and get an infinite number of different uh, uh, um, cluster charts. And that was, that was what we asked him for, such an example. If you mutate at six, then it's not so, uh, then, it's not so not as clear what to do. Are there any other questions for the speaker? Yeah, Han, Han, you can un unmute. I mean, we're we're, we're small. Uh, hi, Eric. Uh, I have a question about the uh, disks that you 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 perform the mutations. You yeah. uh, you you explain them as the subtree in your graph. And my question is that. Um, is every disk that you can possibly mutate is represented by such a graph? And for every such tree, if it can live, does it lift to a unique uh, disk? It's a good question. Uh, the answer is no. Um, you can draw graphs that represent surfaces um, uh, with disks, uh, or with, I should say, S1s that are not represented easily on the graph. Uh, so what I'm talking about is you have a branch point here and a branch point there, and you can imagine, you know, connecting them and getting a two cycle. And you can then try to sort of connect them along the graph, but you might not get that two cycle. Hmm. <clears throat> so you can, but you have to sort of, um, you have to add a few more decorations uh, to the way you describe your one cycles. They're, they're not just the ones that you get for free. Um, what do you mean by decoration? Well, like the, the one cycles that I descri described were uh, along an edge of a graph. So, and then I, what I did is I, I looked at that branch point and, and, and saw the two different, uh, the two different pre-images along the two different um, uh, surfaces uh -huh. that meet at that edge. Right. But if you, but for some cycles, you need the surfaces that are not necessarily meeting at that edge. Uh-huh. And so if you want to sort of ensure that you're moving along those surfaces, you have to add that as a, as a decoration or a label 
And then you can get all the one cycles, but otherwise, uh, otherwise you're not guaranteed that you get them all. Okay. Uh, what about the uniqueness? Like, is it unique for every tree you plot? Is what, sorry, is what unique? Is the disk unique, uniquely determined by the uh, tree? Like, once you plot a tree, it doesn't leave to, like, more than one. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, we, we defined a mutation and, and a rule for, for doing it. Um, I guess you could imagine mutating in some other way. Uh, but I don't, I don't know a rule for doing that. I don't know if Roger has any insights on, on that. Uh, it's the same question of how many uh, Lagrangian disks are there in the neighborhood of a Polterovic surgery? And there, there's a very natural one in the local model. It's probably unique. Okay, okay, all right, thanks. Thanks. Uh, there's a question. I have a question in the chat from Oleg. Yeah, I'm reading, I'm trying to, I'm, right. is there a relation, the question is, is there a relationship between she is on the original base and she is on the new base, R2 with one, R3 with the front of the two dimensional surface? Uh, I, I, um, let me try to interpret the question uh, probably wrongly and then just ask it if, if I don't uh, understand it correctly. So, um, I think I did describe where you, you might have a two-dimensional diagram, let's say on a disk, and then the boundary of, the, of that would be a one-dimensional diagram. And so if you have an object uh, in this category of the two-dimensional diagram, that will restrict to an object in the one-dimensional diagram, in the category defined by the one-dimensional diagram. So then there would be um, a, a morphism. I mean, I guess there's yeah, there's a functor of, of categories from the two-dimensional to the one-dimensional space, a kind of restriction functor. And then therefore also a morphism of moduli spaces. Does that address the question? Um, I think I was asking something slightly different. So oh, you're, describing, you're describing the case where there, there's some boundary, right? This yes. Uh, I, uh -huh. I, was, I was imagining something like, okay, let's talk about the one-dimensional case where mm -hmm. you just have a circle and some dots. Um, there, there's, there's two things it seems like one can do. One can form a one-dimensional Legendrian in the jet space of the circle. That, that, that's, that's what you talked about. But then there's mm -hmm. another thing you could do, which is just look at the co-normals of those points viewed kind of in the, um, how do I say, like the, the boundary of like the cotangent bundle of the circle. So, mm -hmm. so just sheaves on the circle yes. with with uh, micro support at, at those points versus mm -hmm. sheaves on, um, I guess it would be like S1 right. plus R with right. micro support on the, uh, this, this, uh, right. this braid. And yeah, I was just wondering if there's, there's some related, like some functor between yeah. those two categories. Um, let me think for just one second. No, I don't think so. I mean, if you add in a point on the circle, uh, like a, uh, representing a boundary of a stratum or something like that, like like what you want to do, then what do you get? You get an arrow in the quiver. And if, if you if it's if it's not a directed point, so you take the full conormal and not just one direction, then you get two arrows. So the the the, the category of sheaves that you're describing in the circle, micro supported by you know uh, different pieces of a conormal is always going to be some an quiver um, or, or a closed an quiver and hat maybe uh, and then with different arrows uh, and I don't think that's I think it's just different things you can do okay great thanks Oh, here's a question. Is there any conjectural understanding of which knot types admit Legendrian representatives with infinitely many fillings? That's a, that's a good question. I'm going <clears> to, <throat> um, I think uh, in the case where they have quiver de descriptions uh, and uh, the clusters are known to have infinitely many uh, charts, then I think those are the cases where you can show infinitely many fillings. I think there's 
like I, I mentioned work by uh, Roger Casals and Hong Hao Gao, uh, there's, there's other work by Gao, Shen, and Wang where they, uh, they really expand upon this relation to, to cluster theory and then uh, give uh, various classes of examples with infinite, infinitely many cluster charts and therefore infinitely many fillings. Um, so that would be the first what thing to conjecture would be like, you know, are there an infinitely many, do you, can, do you know in advance that there's infinitely many cluster charts? Is that fair, Hong Hao? Uh, yes. Okay. It, so is it, am I supposed to think of this as a pretty rare phenomenon? Like if I took some random connect sum of hyperbolic knots or something, would I, could I expect to see infinitely many fillings or that's kind of a pretty general question, but. <laughs> I, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm supposed to even try to answer that. I mean, those, those the ones that we're describing are, are these, um, you know, um, knots that you can describe easily as braid closures. And, and if you do, I don't know, if, if you give me a description that's not in this, uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't know. I'd, my guess is that it's fairly generic. If I, if I had to put some money on it, uh, it's that it's fairly generic. Other people may guess that. Yeah, please. Um, so first there's a matter of the TV. So you should always add the word max TV representative whenever you pick a smooth knot. You need to make it Legendrian. So you should restrict the max TV to begin with. Once you've done that, um, we initially proved that all torus lengths had infinitely many Lagrangian fillings if, if P and Q are high enough. Um, but in the second version of the paper, you can see that there's infinitely many families of satellite, hyperbolic, and toric knots that satisfy that. So mm -hmm. there doesn't really seem to be a relation between having infinitely many Lagrangian fillings and being, you know, satellite, hyperbolic, or toric. So anywhere on the spectrum of the Thurston classification, th th there's infinitely many families, each of them with infinitely many knots of that type, which have infinitely many Lagrangian fillings. So it, it is relatively generic. For three-stranded braids, you can take a random walk in PSL2Z, thought of as the break room audit center, and a random walk will also give you a Legendrian knot with infinitely many fillings. So that's a kind of precise way of saying a random three-stranded knot mm -hmm. will have that property. But yeah. I see. Are there any further questions for the speaker? Let's see. All right, well, uh, if not, let's give a round of applause again for Eric. Thanks very much for the great talk. Thank you all for your time and attention. Good to see so many familiar faces. Bye. Right. So I'll stop the recording. <laughs>